Hi, and welcome to part three of the Storytellers Workshop. Today, we are going to be looking at redemptive dialogue, or getting past people's inner defenses. We've looked in the past few weeks about how people are on this journey from going their own way to coming to faith in Christ. And last week, we zeroed in especially on this first part of their journey, where they're actually just getting to know you as the messenger. And so in that time, the emphasis was really on relationship building and getting past these passive outer defenses, if you remember. This is them with that wall up to keep out the noise. They're overwhelmed, they're busy, and they got this wall up in their life that just keeps out everything, bad stuff, noisy stuff, and good stuff, including God. But, but what happens is as you develop this relationship, things start to go, go deeper. And it's not that you're not talking about things back here, but you know how it is when you've met somebody, you're getting to know them, you usually skim across the surface of subjects and issues. But as you get to know them and as you build that uh, trust bridge that we talked about, people start feeling safe with you. And when they start feeling safe with you, you start venturing into deeper conversations. And as that happens, the difference between your Christian worldview and their worldview all of a sudden starts to rise to the surface. And what we're going to talk about today is how to navigate that because what happens is then is that their, their active inner defenses kick in, especially if they start to struggle with, with, with Christianity. When they hit this place where maybe they've got that spiritual void or they've seen this difference in you and they start talking to you about these things, we've got a whole new set of obstacles that start to rise up. How do you navigate those? Keep the conversation going this way. Keep the relationship going this way, leading them to Christ. Well, before we dive into that, I want us to take a little stop here, do a little kind of an icebreaker, but really it's kind of a check on where we've been so far. In your workbook, uh, you're on page 14, but turn back a page. And you had some uh, between times practice to do. And so what I want you to do is around your tables, I want you to talk about particularly number one. Uh, what specific actions did you come up with to further a relationship with a non-believer in your life? So, either in your groups last week or uh, during the week, maybe with your partner or um, with others, you were supposed to think about, talk about, and come up with a specific action step you could do to get to know somebody. If you didn't do that, now's the time to do it. So I'll give you a few minutes to talk about some of those action steps, what you came up with, and if you actually had a chance to do something, Share that as well. Okay, we'll get back in a couple of minutes.
Let's bring it back together. One reason I had you do that is because it's just helpful. If you haven't done it, or, and some of you did it, but I find that it's in that just that simple act of having a conversation with another person and just verbally processing, well, what small step can I take? That little thing makes the huge difference of actually doing something, especially if that person gets back to you. So keep doing that. Don't let this be the only time. Remember, par pair up with that partner of yours. Keep having these kind of conversations. You'll be amazed how that simple act will, will keep furthering the process. Well, before we look at uh, these redemptive dialogues that we're talking about, I wanted to take a quick moment and emphasize this issue of the gospel and relationships and this whole idea in our, in our storyteller's uh, paradigm of, of character and what it means to be a character in their story. I love Paul's description of himself as he uh, reached out to, when he describes how he brought the gospel to the Thessalonians. Here's what he said. He said, we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children when we came to you. He's talking about himself and his companions. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives too. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. I mean, this is a, this is a powerful image in thinking story-wise. You know, we talk about roles and types. You don't get, you know, any closer or, or more, more deep in relationship than the metaphor of a, of a father and a mother. Uh, fathers and mothers, of course, I mean, they, they're connected to their kids. They lay their lives down for their kids. They pour themselves out for their kids. Paul didn't just come bring words. He didn't just transfer information. Paul shared his life with these people. And, and in doing so, he's imitating Jesus. So Jesus, when Jesus came, I mean, God didn't settle for just handing down words. That was Mount Sinai, you know, handing down the words, and that didn't work. So God came down and became one of us. In story language, he entered our story. He entered the stories of the disciples and the tax collectors and the sinners and all those people in the first century. The word we use is incarnation, which means that he embodied the message. And the reason this is so important is because we have a message that if we don't embody it, then it kind of falls flat. Because it, again, it's not just information. Uh, it's a message about God's love, his self-sacrificial love. So when Jesus brought it, he didn't just tell us God loves us, he died for us. Now we're the messengers. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Which means we also have to not just bring words, but our lives, our story has to embody the story, the upper story that we're telling people. If it doesn't, they see the mismatch. When we're telling them how much God loves them, how much he sacrificed for them, but we're not willing to give them the time of day, that mismatch, they see it, and the words that are coming out of our mouth just fall flat. So I just want to impress that. We, we kind of saw that before. We're going to keep seeing that. You're going to see it especially next week. So keep that in mind as we're going forward. But we have a problem, and that is that people out there in the world have certain perceptions of us. So if you, just, you, know, if you were to just walk up and meet a non-believer, they, they don't know you, uh, you can assume that A, if they're, not, if they're a non-believer, they not only don't believe the message, but they also probably don't trust the messenger. And if you identify yourself as a Christian, well, then they probably immediately are a little suspicious of you. We have a perception problem. We have to figure out how to change that perception. Uh, David Kinneman, who works with Barna Research, he wrote a book, and Barna had, had actually done uh, research on this, and Kinneman wrote a book called Unchristian, where he lays out uh, their research identifying some of the perceptions that non-believers have of Christians in America. So he not only lays out the perceptions, he also helpfully lays out some possible new perceptions. Okay, so I want you to listen to these, and I want you to think again in terms of a character and a story, you and people's lives. So here's the misperceptions or the negative perceptions they have and possible uh, new ones we can bring. First of all, hypocritical, you guys have heard that one before. Christians say one thing, but they live something entirely different. New perception, Christians are transparent about their flaws. They act first and talk second. Notice it doesn't say Christians are perfect. It just says they're honest, they, they own their stuff. Okay, People don't expect us to be perfect, uh, but they don't. when we're in denial, that doesn't work. Anti-homosexual, Christians show contempt for gays and lesbians. 
That's their perception. Again, all this is based on research. New perception. Christians show compassion to all people to, to, and love all people regardless of their lifestyle. Now that one makes some Christians uncomfortable. <laughs> but that's Jesus. That's how Jesus was. With Amen. The only time Jesus ever seemed to show any kind of contempt, it was for the religious leadership, not for the, quote, tax collectors and sinners. Insincere, Christians are concerned only with converting others. New perception, Christians cultivate relationships and environments where others can be deeply transformed by God. What's interesting about these is, in a way, they say the same thing, right? This one is much richer and fuller. This one has that notch on the belt, you're a project, get in, get out, get it done. This has a, I care about you deeply, long term. I care about all of you, including connecting you with God. A non-believer reads that and actually, I think, would respect that as opposed to that one. Too political. Christians are primarily motivated by a political agenda and promote right-wing politics. New perception. Christians are characterized by respecting people, thinking biblically, finding solutions to complex problems. This one you could spend a lot on. This obviously created lots of controversy in our, in our culture. Just want to say that the perception they have of us is that we are in the pocket of one of the parties. And as Christians, we need to the perception they should have of us is that we serve King Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that where, where we would agree with one party or the other, we will agree. But where they deviate from King Jesus, well, we'll call them out on that. Right. And that, I think, would cause them to respect us. Judgmental. Christians are prideful and quick to find faults in others. New perception. Christians show grace by finding the good in others and seeing the potential to be Christ followers. The language Jesus used for this was he would, he would say often to to someone who was far from God, but who showed that they were seeking, he would say, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. He would encourage them forward. He wouldn't just bring down the, the condemnation on them. Okay? How do we get this new perception? How do we uh, create this? Uh, how do we, uh, in that process, so looking at our, our chart again, how do we you know, engage people in a way Whereas they were getting to know them, where we get a minus nine going, where they, uh, well, minus ten, they have a positive attitude towards the messenger, and then see that difference. That would be that new perception. It's obviously more than just arguing with them. You know, that's, just, that's not going to do it. You don't just tell them the new perception. They've got to see it in us, and that's where that embodying of the gospel comes in. But how exactly uh, do we do this? Well, one way is to find common ground. You know, you watch people who disagree with each other. Uh, the common thing that you see with people is, is that they, well, they aren't listening. I mean, usually you look at them and, and you can see it from the outside. You can watch them and go, I can just tell. One person says something. The other person just says something back. The other person just, you know, and they're not really hearing each other. Problem is that we're in the middle of one of those discussions. We don't see ourselves doing that. And so what I want to help you do when, as they start to raise issues bring up these, these defenses, it's help you figure out how to uh, get past those defenses, okay? And the key to doing that, just to get to the point, is to keep your eyes focused on the heart. You're trying to get to the heart. What I want you to picture in your mind when you think about this, just sort of pretend that here you are, they let you in the front door, now you're in the courtyard, but now all of a sudden these issues come up, their defenses rise, so picture one of these soldiers on the inside is now coming at you. That's one of their defenses. You know, like, I don't know, pick anything. Like, uh, Christians are intolerant. You know, they just don't accept other people. That's why I don't like Christianity. Say it's something like that. Pretend that's not like a soldier coming at you with a spear. <laughs> okay? Our tendency, of course, is to stare at the spear and get fixated on the spear and want to defend ourselves against the spear. What I want you to do is look over the shoulder of that soldier past him to that to that stronghold behind him where the heart is. Keep one eye on the spear, but keep that other eye on the heart. And by the way, try saying shoulder of the soldier four times fast. It's really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> so keep your eye on the heart. Don't let these outer, these, these well, they're inner defenses. Don't let these active defenses cause you to focus too much on that because you're not going to get anywhere. In fact, this process is going to move backwards if you do that. Let me show you how it looks. First, this verse, the purpose in a man's mind is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. 
What you're trying to do is get past this defense and get down to those deep waters where their heart dwells. Because remember, that's what God's after. And you're gonna, I'm going to explain later, especially next week, why this is so crucial. This isn't just a rhetorical thing. This is crucial for the gospel. Here's how it looks. So they, they throw an objection up, and some, something that they say. You know, let, we'll just use the Christians are intolerant objection, okay? Our tendency as human beings, I don't know if it's an American, I think it's just a human thing, is to follow this line. As we immediately hear the objection, we hear the sort of intellectual side, we go to the mind side of it, and we jump right down to the disagreement. That's what we tend to focus in on immediately. And then our next step is to then, to think in response, well, that's getting in the way, I gotta get rid of this objection. So I'm gonna respond in kind. I'm gonna come back, and I, if I can just explain to this person, if I can just you know, obliterate this objection, well then they'll move one step closer to Jesus, right? So we come back and we, and, we, and we approach their mind and we try to do it and then we wonder why it really doesn't work. Two reasons it doesn't work are, first of all, it, uh, it focuses in on the points of furthest dif uh, distance between you and them. Okay, so you've started with where you're furthest apart, which means now you've just created a situation where you've got a long way to go. The other thing it does is it tends to then put people back on their heels. All they're going to do is hear their little soldier getting attacked and probably send a few more soldiers as reinforcements. It's just going to, it's just going to turn into basically an argument. Okay? The other reason it doesn't work is that you're ignoring this whole other part of them. And, it, and that's actually the more important part of them, and that's the heart. What I would encourage you to do instead is try to train your mind to go down this line. To focus on their heart and not to the areas of disagreement, because there can be disagreement there, but focus instead on the common ground. Try to find common ground and start there. Another way to show this, um, well, well, then you go back to mind and you try to find the common ground on that side too. So you're trying to find common ground first, and we'll get back to this in a moment. Okay, A way to show it again is that here you are with your Christian worldview. Here's them with their non-Christian worldview. You've got stuff you believe way over here that's really far from what they believe over there. Um, this is like a relative scale. So the further this way, the closer you are. Okay, So in the middle, you've got common ground. This is where you overlap. We don't disagree with everything that non-believers believe, right? And stuff over here, you know, it's close. We're close. Our tendency, of course, is to notice the stuff way out here. And then our tendency is to make that our starting point. When you make that your starting point, you are pushing. Both sides are pushing. And frankly, you look pushy. <laughs> and they don't like it. They just get defensive. It just creates defensiveness. Instead, what we should do is start with the common ground. And that's more of a pulling and a drawing as we, as we increase, you're trying to increase this area of common ground through, through dialogue and discussion that I'm going to show you in a minute, until there comes a tipping point where they're actually looking at this and they're going, you know, and then they like turn their life over to Jesus after that common ground has gotten big enough. All right. We got an example of this, uh, Paul in Athens. He's a, he's a great example. So in the book of Acts, Luke records this great story of Paul. Uh, he's hanging around waiting for his friends, and it says he wanders around the city, and he notices all the idols, it, and, it, the, and Luke says his spirit was provoked within him. Okay? Now there's a reason for that. It's because Paul's Jewish, and a first century Jew can't stand idolatry. And even though Paul's become a Christian, remember back in the Old Testament, uh, the, the Israelites were playing with idols all the time. But God cured them of that after like a thousand years of dealing with them. And by the time they come back from captivity, by the time of Jesus, Jews hate idolatry. Okay? And Paul's one of them. So he goes around, his spirit is provoked, and it says he does like, like he normally does, and he goes in the synagogues and he starts you know, arguing with the Jews about the gospel. And then it says he went out to the marketplace and he starts talking to the, um, some of the Greek philosophers, the Stoics and the Epicureans. And one of them, some of them say, what's this babbler talking about? And, you know, he's talking about foreign gods and all this. 
So one of them grabs him and says, hey, you should come talk to the rest of us. They take him up to what's called the Areopagus or Mars Hill. This is where the philosophers get together and talk about things. It's, and Luke points out that Athenians love to just sit around talking about new stuff. And here's Paul with some new stuff. So let's hear this guy. And so they set him in the middle. And here's what, basically what Paul says. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious in many ways, in every way, he says. He goes, because I've been walking around your city and I saw all your objects of worship. And I noticed one of your altars had an inscription to an unknown God. And so this God that you worship is unknown. I'm going to tell you who he is. He's the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Uh, he said, because of that, he doesn't live in shrines made by man. Um, rather, he, he created everything, and he set out uh, from one person. He created all the nations in hopes that people would feel after him and look for him and seek for him and find him. And he says, in fact, he's not that far off. And then Paul turns and he starts quoting their poets and their philosophers. He says, your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. And another one said, we are indeed his offspring. And since we're his offspring... We shouldn't be trying to represent him with gold and silver and stones. Now, he said, at the times of past ignorance, God is overlooked. But now, he's telling everybody everywhere to repent. And he has set a day of judgment and a man by which he's going to judge the world. And he gave us assurance of this man, Jesus, by raising him from the dead. At that point, they kind of, he gets a reaction. Some of them are like, resurrection of the dead, and they mock him. Others are like, we want to hear more about this. And some choose to believe. I want you to think about that story, and I want you to think, what did Paul not do, and what did Paul do? Let's look at what he did, or did not do first. What he did not do is he did not open with contempt for their sinful practices. Yeah, this is on uh, page 16 in your workbook. He didn't open with contempt for their sinful practices. He never quoted the Bible, which is what he would do if he was talking to the Jews. That's what he did in the synagogues. And he didn't start with where they were furthest from God. Instead, what he does is he opens with a spiritual affirmation. He says, I see that in every way you are very religious. And he's not being facetious. He's not making fun of them. He means it. He quotes their literature and he references their stories. He found common ground with them. In fact, when he starts turning on the idol thing, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that when Luke mentions Epicureans and Stoics, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also don't like idolatry. So he's actually speaking their language. Um, he's finding common ground. Finally, he connected the Jesus story to their story. And again, a lot don't realize this, but Paul is actually drawing on a very old story of theirs connected to that unknown God. turns out that one of those poets that he quoted is Epimenides. I think it's the one who said, In him we live and move and have our being. Well, about six centuries before this event, Paul on Mars Hill, there was a plague in Athens, and the Athenians were freaking out, and what do pagans do when they have a plague? They start offering sacrifices to all their gods. The plague kept going, the plague kept going. So then they called for, they heard about this guy Epimenides, who's a respected pagan prophet, basically, brought him in, and he's like, okay, have you offered all your sacrifices to all the gods? Yep, check, 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 they've done everything. He goes, well, there must be some god that you're unaware of that you have gotten angry. So he, he had this funny way of figuring out where to build an altar. They built an altar. They offered sheep on the altar, and the plague ceased. And they put an inscription on this, the unknown god. And they kept it for six centuries. Because I want to make sure, whoever this god was, we've got to make sure we, you know, keep him happy. Paul comes along, probably knows the story, because he's quoting that guy. And he basically fills in the blanks of their story and tells them, I'll tell you who that God is. He connected the Jesus story to their story. All in all, what he did was he incredibly built common ground. Let's do this as a simple example today, actually the one I, I've mentioned. So, common one, you Christians are arrogant. And again, they say this in different ways, or you're intolerant because you say you're right and everybody else is wrong. The intellectual label for this is Christian exclusivism. You know, we, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. 
I want you to train your mind to go through a series of steps, okay? There's the objection. What's our natural response to the objection? Our natural mind knee-jerk response is to what? Defend the exclusivity of Jesus, to try to explain to them well, why we believe that Jesus is the only way, to defend absolute truth, to tell them what's wrong with relativism and how it doesn't work and get all intellectual about it. But you'll find, and I've done a lot of apologetics, that you, if you come at it that way, it's probably, it's, you know, you might go round and round for a while, but if that's all you do, it's probably not going to work. The likely outcome of your natural response, they're just going to think you're arrogant and close-minded, which is what they said in the beginning. You're just going to reinforce the perception that they have. There you are digging in, telling them how wrong they are and how right you are. It doesn't work. Here's the key part. What I want you to do is ask yourself, what's the unstated heart concern behind the stated mind objection that they made, okay? What, are they, what's, what bothers them? Something like this. I don't like arrogant people who think they know better than everybody else and don't think they can learn from anyone else. Or you can state this 10 different ways. But some version of, I just don't like arrogant people. Do we have any common ground with this heart concern? Well, I would say so. <laughs> common ground, humility is good. Accepting and tolerating others is good even when you disagree. I find it fascinating, and I, and I heard this even the other day, how often Christians speak negatively of tolerance. Now, I know why they do. They do because they see how the whole tolerance thing gets, gets twisted and used to shut down conversation and shut down a search for the truth. I get that. But it's, it's curious, and I think it's a trick of the enemy to get us talking negatively about the concept of tolerance when, guess what? It's a Christian virtue. It's a virtue in the West that came out of Christianity. Christianity emphasized humility, love your enemy, even if you disagree with your enemy. Um, this came out of, of Christianity, and yet we've sort of let it go. We've given it away sort of to the other side, and now we're the ones attacking it. Not good. We actually agree that humility is good. This is the common ground you want to build on with them. And you can do this with every objection that they raise. And so what I want to let you do right now is actually have practice at that. So we're going to take a minute. And you're going to take this one, stated objection. There's one you hear people say something like this. People are basically good. Yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but I don't think of myself as a sinner. That sinner thing, you know. I think people are basically good. You've heard that one, I'm sure. I want you to take that around your tables, um, out there in your groups. Talk about this. Go through what is your natural response? What is the likely outcome of your natural response? Then you really want to get to this. What is their unstated heart concern, and where can you find common ground? That's where you want to land. Okay, so take a few minutes and do that, and we'll pull back together and compare notes.
Okay, so let's pull it back together. Um, really quickly, I just want to go over what, what was talked about here, and you guys uh, out there compare notes with us. Okay, so uh, stated objection, natural response, things we said here were quote scripture at them, you know, Romans 3.23, either from the Bible, just quote all these verses that say what big sinners we are, or maybe start rattling off a catalog of human evil, <laughs> uh, or maybe even point the finger right at this person, and that would be a really bad idea. Um, but somehow try to prove that we're a bunch of sinners. What's the natural response you're going to get from that? Or, or the natural um, outcome of that response is going to be that they're going to get defensive, they're going to feel condemned, you're just going to increase shame, they're going to feel bad, they're going to think you're saying they're bad, uh, they're a bad person. Who, who wants to hear that, right? This leads us to what is their unstated heart's concern? Why do they feel this way? Why are they defensive? Well, because their heart concern, their heart's desire is to be loved unconditionally. They want, uh, regard, they, they, if you ask the question right, and they said it earlier, I'm not perfect. That's your little, that's your little window in. Nobody claims to be perfect. They don't want that lack of perfection to mean that they are rejected, that they are condemned, that they're out. The common ground, then, is all of our universal desire for grace, okay, to be accepted, to be loved unconditionally, regardless of how good or bad we are. That's your, that's your in, okay? They might want to go to the, thing, the extreme of saying how great we are as a basis of acceptance. That could be a fruitful conversation, to say acceptance is not based on how bad we are or how good we are. The world's way is to try to say how good we are. And some Christians, you know, are dwelling too much on how bad we are. We all want to be accepted regardless. So there's your common ground. And you can have a fruitful conversation from there. Um, I want to stop for a minute and just tell you a, a great story, um, a great example in current. We heard Paul's story in, in Athens. But there's a good current story that not just embodies what we've just talked about here, but also really reaches back to what we've talked about so far. It's a great picture of stories intersecting. The three stories, a believer, a non-believer, and God's big upper story. And it's about Chick-fil-A. <laughs> we all love our Chick-fil-A. And I think most of us are aware that Chick-fil-A is owned by a Christian uh, a family started by a Christian family, owned by a Christian family. Uh, about six years ago, uh, the president of Chick-fil-A was Dan Cathy. And I think he's the son, I believe, of the, of the founder of, of Chick-fil-A. Um, and as we all know, Chick-fil-A has donated money to pro-family groups. They took a stand against gay, gay marriage uh, by you know, supporting traditional marriage through their giving. This created a lot of conflict. Uh, about six years ago, there were, you know, there were then protests against Chick-fil-A, and then there were counter-protests by Christians who did the really courageous thing of going down and eating more chicken, um, <laughs> which is a whole other story. But it got kind of ugly between both sides, um, and that's pretty much what everybody heard out there in the media, this ugly fight over chicken and traditional marriage and everything. But what a lot of people don't know is what Dan Cathy did. Uh, and it's captured in a story written by a guy named Shane Widmire. Um, this guy, Shane Widmire, is a gay rights activist. He, he heads a, a, um, um, a gay advocacy group that actually, seven months before this article was written, uh, he had organized a protest against Chick-fil-A. Okay, come up against them. Describes himself as a 40-year-old gay man, lifelong activist, the title of this article, and this article was written for the Huffington Post, which you probably know is a, a left-wing um, online publication. The title is Dan and Me, My Coming Out as a Friend of Dan Cathy and Chick-fil-A. It's a powerful story of what we're talking about. What happened was this protest was going, all this brouhaha was happening, and he gets a phone call from Dan Cathy, and he's thinking, oh, here comes the... Here he's calling out the dogs and probably be lawyers coming or whatever like that. But Dan Cathy just wanted to talk to him personally, started asking him questions. That led to some texting back and forth. A lot of questions on the part of Dan Cathy. Very interesting. He, he directly says lots of questions. And he said that led to more and more conversations, uh, finally ultimately leading to, to, to personal one-on-ones. They started getting together and talking. 
He said these were sometimes very awkward, but always genuine and kind. He goes on and describes the development of this relationship, and I want you to hear these words that he says. He says, Through all of this, Dan and I shared respectful, enduring communication, and we built trust. Remember that bridge of trust? His demeanor has always been one of kindness and openness. Even when I continued to directly question his public actions and his funding decisions, Dan embraced the opportunity to have dialogue and hear my perspective. He and I were committed to a better understanding of one another. Our mutual hope was to find common ground, if possible, and to build respect no matter what. And this is what they did. But it gets even more personal than that. He says, throughout the conversations, Dan expressed a sincere interest in my life, wanting to get to know me on a personal level. He wanted to know about where I grew up, my faith, my family, even my husband Tommy. In return, I learned about his wife and his kids, and I gained an appreciation for his devout belief in Jesus Christ and his commitment to being a follower of Christ more than just a Christian. Dan expressed regret and genuine sadness when he heard of people being treated unkindly in the name of Chick-fil-A, but he offered no apologies for his genuine beliefs about marriage. What a beautiful picture of the combination of grace and truth. He never compromised, but you could see the respect that this guy has for, for, for Dan Cathy. And the, he never compromised the truth, but at the same time, he was gracious. It culminates in Dan Cathy uh, inviting him to the Chick-fil-A Bowl <laughs> as a guest and as a friend, uh, right there in public, all the cameras and everything. And, and, and I just want to read this last part. Uh, invited me to be his personal, personal guest. This was an event that Campus Pride, that was his organization, and others had planned to protest. Had I been played, seduced into this, his billionaire's life? No. It was Dan who took a great risk in inviting me. He stood to face the ire of his conservative base and a potential boycott by being seen or photographed with an LGBT activist. He could have been portrayed as caving to the gay agenda by welcoming me. Instead, he stood next to me most of the night, putting respect ahead of fear. You know, I don't know where this guy's at spiritually um, at this point, but if he comes to Christ, it's going to be because of this. And this is the whole package. This wasn't engaging in a debate, though they did talk the substance. They obviously talked about it. There was dialogue about the issues. But as you can see, he was a character in this guy's story. He took interest in his story. He shared his story and, and brought God's story into it. Beautiful picture of, of grace and truth in action. The last thing I want to do is talk about one more way. So this just takes everything we've said, how to build common ground, adds another dimension to it. It's really the same thing coming at it, giving you another practical uh, piece to the puzzle, and that is wondering our way into spiritual conversations, okay, by asking good questions. So what we're talking about now is questions. Was, I found it fascinating in, in his piece that he said that what Dan Cathy started with was a lot of questions, asked a lot of questions. And that's what we need to learn how to do is ask questions. Quit correcting and telling and ask questions of people. Questions minimize conflict. They build on common ground. They deepen the relationship. And they attract people to the gospel. Okay? They attract people to the gospels. We ask questions. They, well, that's partly the mirror effect. Is As we ask questions, they become curious about what we believe. And they start asking us questions back. Now, there's three great questions. They're there in your workbook. Uh, there's a lot of questions you can ask, and I don't want to give you a bunch of canned questions. These are just to get you thinking that way. But three ones you want to keep in your back pocket are these. What do you mean by? How did you come to that conclusion? And have you considered? What do you mean by is the get to the definitions. So much disagreement happens with people because they don't stop and ask, well, what do you mean by that word or phrase? Christians are intolerant. What do you mean by intolerant? Because it turns out there's two different definitions of that. And you've got to get that cleared up first or you're not going to get anywhere. And it gets them thinking. When you ask the question, then they start reflecting on it. It causes reflection. How did you come to that conclusion? Um, you know, you're just asking. And, and that's not just intellectually, how did you come to that conclusion? Like, give me your logic. Try to put that in a, in a, in a life context. You know, what in your life... Uh, what's, what's gone on in your life? How, how is it? How has your experience 
led you to that conclusion. Usually there's a story behind why people believe what they believe. Okay? Try to get to the story, their story, not just their logic. And the last one is, have you considered, and, and that's where you might bring the alternative in. I like to word this question, I like to say, what would you say to a person who said, da 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 The reason I do that is because, okay, then you, the da 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 is the alternative. It's the challenge. It's the Christian worldview or the Christian view of things. But instead of pitting them against me and just saying it, I'm saying, what would you say to a person who says, they're arguing with somebody else who's not in the room now. And I'm still their friend and ally, just listening to their thinking and trying to understand how they think. It's not personal, okay? But, but that's another uh, of the questions. Now, it's important that when we ask these questions, we are genuinely curious, okay? This has to be real. This can't just be a ploy. Um, you've got a list of questions in there um, and a reference given to uh, Doug Pollock from the book God Space. I recommend that book. Uh, he has... Um, some great questions in there, but he has these comments to make too that I wanted to really highlight. He says, good wondering questions. If you're going to ask good wondering questions, they're born out of a desire to better understand someone. So it's you actually wanting to, to, to really get to know this person. They flow naturally out of your context and your conversations. They're not canned and stilted and just coming out of nowhere. They demonstrate that you, you've been listening thoughtfully because usually you're hearing something and that provokes another question. You know, the, my question should be related to whatever they just said. Um, they're open-ended. They promote more dialogue and they promote reflection. They're not leading questions. They're supposed to just promote more discussion. They probe sensitively and reflectively into someone's belief systems. And I would say into their life, too, their experiences. Okay? And they compel others to investigate the Christian life. They, again, they do that because of the mirror effect. They, they make them curious about, well, what do you think? That's just natural. Wondering is not using questions to gain control of a conversation so that you can get your point across. <laughs> it is not a set of memorized questions to herd people towards a decision you think that they should make. So again, not leading questions. It is not a springboard from which to launch into a monologue. All three of these basically are say, it's saying that they're not a rhetorical trick. You're not just playing rhetorical games with people. This needs to be genuine. You need to be sincerely interested in them and what they believe and, again, why they believe it. Because you can't fake that. If it's genuine, they'll, pick, they'll sense that. It creates huge, not just intellectual common ground, it creates an emotional common ground. You're a safe person. And they want to talk about this stuff with you because you're not out to get them and prove them wrong. Here's a few. I'm not going to go over all the ones on your, in your list in there. I just wanted to point out a few. These are just examples, okay? Again, don't memorize these. Just use these to spur your thinking. And, and by the way, another word for wondering, you know, wondering is, is I'm curious. You don't have to say every time, I'm wondering, da da da, da. But I'm curious, da 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 da, da is, is, Or help me understand. Help me to understand this. So you can substitute that in every time it says wondering. You know, that's an interesting perspective. I'm curious how you came to that conclusion. Could you explain that some more? Yeah, I like this one. If you could arrange, you know, hypothetically, if I could arrange for you to speak at my church about your impression of Christians, I'm wondering what you would say. <laughs> you know, that's just a good thought experiment for them. I'm wondering what role religion has played in shaping your life. You know, tell me about your religious background and, and how that shaped you. I'm wondering why the topic of God seems to stir up such strong emotions. You know, when we get to talking about it, it kind of gets intense. Why, why is that? I like this one a lot. I've thought long and hard about our last conversation, and here's what I'm still wondering about. This communicates that they said some things that, that they got you thinking, and that's an honor to them. That is a huge sign of respect. I've been, I've been thinking about what you said, but I'm still curious about this. Could you, could you help me understand this better? Mm -hmm. You know, when people know you're thinking about them when you're, they're not there, I mean, that shows something. It's a good thing. I'm wondering how my answer to that question made you feel. Notice that, that starts getting to the heart stuff. Not just what it makes you think, but feel. Okay, so those are some I wonder things. Um, what about, we never answered any of these questions that they have, and I've done this on purpose. I know that irritates some of us logical-minded people who really want to answer their questions. But I really want you to hold back from that. Now, there's a reason for it. 
What about those head objections? Notice, it's, first of all, it's the last step, not the first. So you want to keep the head thing for the end. And there's a reason. It's because if you've done all this other stuff and found the common ground, and again, this is free marriage advice and free parenting advice, okay? You deal with a person's heart first, nine times out of ten, the objection just goes away. And in the one out of ten, it has shrunk in importance. The emotion has been taken out of it, um, and, and it's, it's, it's like you can, you can address it if they still need it addressed, but it's a whole lot easier to address it at that point. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have all the emotional baggage and intensity. Um, so that's why you want to keep it last. A lot of times, like I said, it just drops away. If you're going to address their intellectual thing and you're not sure how to address it, just be a learner with them. Okay? You don't have to have a perfect answer. In fact, that's a good occasion to say, hey, I want to go, I want to think about that. You know, I want to, I want, can I think about that a little bit? That's a great question you just asked. And so, I, you know, then come back. Say, hey, I've been thinking about it. Here's what I, I was thinking. What do you think? Keep the conversation going. But you posture yourself as a learner, not as an expert, not as a defender of the faith, as a fellow learner. Okay? It is a powerful combination, a powerful combination that people, when they see it, it's very attractive. When they know you're a follower of Jesus, that you have a certain um, confidence there, and yet you freely admit you don't know stuff, you're still learning, you're still... That's the kind of person they want to be, someone who has some sort of rock they're standing on, but is still open and learning and growing. Um, it shows a deep kind of confidence. When we pop off with answers to everything they say, it, it betrays that actually there's an insecurity there. Okay, so deep confidence is willing to admit, I don't know, let me figure that out. Finally, get help if you need it. Um, you can bring your friend to a seeker group. We've got other individuals here in the church who are really good at dealing with some of these questions. You could say to your friend, hey, I got a buddy who um, is, is actually loves to talk about this stuff, is really good at it. Um, he, he's also, you know, does this and, and he's got a few friends and some of us are going to get together and look at this. You want to come? You know, we're going to delve into the same questions that you were asking. We're going to talk about um, and so let me know if that's something, if you've got uh, friends like that that are kind of further along the scale that are asking those questions, I can get you connected with some of the people uh, here in our church who would love to get one of those groups together. Or if you'd like to be trained to, to lead a group like that, let me know. I'd love to help you with that. Uh, so that's dealing with the head. Again, like uh, it, you'll be amazed at how much the head stuff just kind of goes away when you deal with the heart stuff. What's coming next? Well, what's coming next follows right on the heels of this. Um, you might be asking, where is the gospel in all of this? We haven't hardly talked about the gospel. Two things. One, we have, actually, because that was what I was talking about at the beginning of this whole thing. I want to stress that our life has to embody the gospel. Everything we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks is an act of embodying the gospel, showing respect, loving them, involving yourself in your life, taking interest in them. The gospel is that Jesus came to this earth, right? And became incarnate. So step one is to go into their world. That's the gospel. That's you living the gospel. When the words start to flow, how, how are they experiencing you? Are they experiencing the grace of the gospel? Again, this is preparatory. And now, the reason why it's so important to look over the shoulder of that soldier <laughs> and look at the heart is because what you'll notice is the mind objections, they're about one or two steps removed from the actual themes of the gospel. But the heart stuff, that common ground heart stuff, they are right there next to the gospel. Remember, they fear condemnation. Isn't that the heart of the gospel? Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but I came to save it. You're going to find that when you get to the heart, you are now right there with the gospel or the gospel is right there, ready to be presented. So that's what we're going to look at next, is, is those heart themes that people have. When you actually get to that level with people, how do you explain the gospel in a way that speaks to their heart? We'll see you next week.